Hi, I'm Zhu Shen. I am the director and playwright of OIWA, The Ghost of Yotsuya. Welcome to the world of OIWA, part two, the creatives of OIWA. In this segment, we are going to talk to the designers who have worked with me for the last three years. And this is a chance for you to understand their processes and their approach for the work. And this is a chance for you to get a behind the scenes look of the brains and processes of the creatives. At the beginning of the project, I told my designers that we were going to reference the Japanese culture, but not be literal about it. So we're going to be distilling and referencing it, but then we're going to try to draw the essence of it so that we can make it our own. After the brief, I start to look for photos of like island bamboo forests, pictures of the mansion of Oiwa. That is when I run into a little bit of a, of a problem because there's not a lot of online resources that's available that show the interior of the Ito period houses. Yes, you can look online when you Google Japanese, old Japanese houses, Japanese architect, architecture, but a lot of those contents is also more of like famous or touristy uh, buildings, like even temples, castles, but which not necessarily translate to the mood or the location, the environment that we're looking for, specifically for OIWA. So for those buildings, some of the reference I, I look for is no longer photograph, but more of paintings, uh, old Japanese paintings, which does have a reference of like things they used during that period, or even the costumes or colors that they used at, at that period. Especially one item to note is uh, we, we need a mirror, uh, which is actually kind of important piece in this performance. But uh, in a real naturalistic uh, setting or environment, actually you don't really find like a full-length mirror in a, in a Japanese culture. The mirrors that they had at the period is a lot of things, it's like bronze mirror. Even if it's big, it's basically round and it's kind of set on a makeup box or drawer. So it's not very big, but because in this performance, we actually need the mirror to kind of show the full length of Oiwa and also for that particular scene there's actually like two Oiwa one within the mirror which is the reflection of Oiwa and one outside and also there's this like crossover from the mirror within the mirror and out so for that we kind of suspend the, the realism of it and for that I use the, the motif of an Ito mirror but enlarge it to become a full length mirror especially for Oiwa Beforehand, I did watch the recording of the workshop and rehearsal which they, they was done in Japan. But I guess it's a recording, so you, you don't feel the intensity of the offstage business. Because most of what I see from the point of the camera is what's in the performance area. Our first draft was basically a lot of vertical structure or piping, that would change and kind of seamlessly transform into different environment based on the scenes. We kind of a rethink of the design what was really after the Singapore showcase at Center 42. It was uh, almost pure madness. <laughs> During the showcase, what I see was, was quite horrifying. I cannot imagine how whether there's enough time even for the puppeteers to move to the wings, drop the whatever puppets they have on their hand and then come back on stage and then into another persona or another character. So it was just way too intense, especially for the puppeteers and performers to take care of so many things because most likely they will also be taking care of some of the scene change as well. So well, after that, Zijian and, and I have a few discussion. Like we kind of rethink that we keep some of the accent, like the pipes that we have discussed about, but uh, use it in in a slightly different way. So we will be making full use of like let's say the the fry bar systems in Victoria Theatre to assist with the scene change, so that we won't uh, 
need to involve the actor so much in the in the in the physical scene change in that sense, and and also we decide to add a more like a framework of a huge Japanese ar architecture. It can be interpreted as a huge courtyard with a garden in the center, or when the pipes or the bamboo forest fry out, it can becomes uh, the interior of the house, or it's still within the mansion compound. We add in other elements like the Japanese lighting doors elements. We add like mirrors, which is in the interior of the room. So the location can be transformed very easily and then also much more seamlessly without a, a very chaotic kind of scene change. While designing for OUA, there's a few more things that as a set designer, I have to take into consideration because uh, not just what, uh, what happens on stage as audience will see, but there's also a lot of things happening at the same time while performance is going on on stage because there's things like puppets that need to be changed, costumes need to be changed. There's like a lot of mass changes. Uh, so, so literally what you see maybe is peace and calm on stage, but literally our backstage is, is, a, is a chaotic, I mean, it's a organized chaotic moments. I've worked long enough with TC such that he can throw me a brief like Japanese pawn, meaning graphic and stark expressionism, and I can openly roll my eyes at him, yet know what to do with it at the same time. I've come to believe in what I term as um, essentialism, that every work has an intrinsic nature, a core essence that will inform you how it should be lit. I don't immediately set constraints or parameters for myself. It's unnecessary, I think, to limit oneself right at the start. On a practical level though, there will always be constraints such as budget and the resources available. And other elements uh, naturally draw up parameters along the way like the script, director's vision, set design, etc. These obviously do affect lighting design, which is partly why it's so important to be there early in the process so that you can raise or flag concerns as soon as you're able to foresee them and negotiate options um, before they become problems. So the thing is, um, for lighting, actually 80% of my work is preparation. 20% of it is the actual setup in theatre. Um, and the irony of it is that 80 or even 100%, I would say, of the actual thing that people see has to be done in that 20%. The entire process is just to make sure that I am 200% ready for the eventual 20%. When we first research into the festivities and the Japanese art forms and theater art forms, we of course looked at Kabuki. And TC really liked the contrast between something that is so dramatic and joyous and bursts of colours in contrast to the horror genre. But of course, they have to be in sync. It was quite challenging at first. So we looked into other sources of inspirations. We also explored a lot of um, deconstruction in, in, in the form of cuts and the way the garments are finished. Once we have a costume parade, right? Then we'll be able to say whether to act again. So TC gave very specific instructions to how he would like the overall look to be. And he mentioned something that is structured, almost paper-like quality to the garments itself. So that kind of informed my fabric selection choices already. Um, I'm looking at um, cotton canvases, uh, linen canvases, brocades, and even cotton or gandy, things that generally have a stiffer property to it. So with regards to the finishing of the garments, you will see that there's a lot of raw finishing. And we, the, the reason why we want to do this is because doing a clean finish, it's relatively, I would say, easy. And if you look at how the garments and the seam works are done, Normally, the sewing allowances would be covered inside, but we have chosen to let the allowances be shown outside and we can fray these such that it gives another texture to, to an otherwise very flat surface. The 
Colors are obviously new and very bright and the finishing looks very worn so you don't quite know where to place these garments and in TC's brief, he wanted it to be sort of otherworldly, um, not era specific. So um, in, in this way, um, I think the costumes have a very interesting um, contrast when these two opposing elements are contrasted against each other. So the immediate challenge was to recreate the the many layers of a Japanese costume such that it becomes only one or two layers as compared to your usual five to even 20 layers such that it minimizes the quick changing steps to just three or four steps. We have to explore a lot of um, different ways of constructing the clothes differently uh, while reducing the bulk of the fabric because you really do want the cars to be able to move uh, in a rather comfortable manner rather than have you know, piles of fabrics and garments and they don't know what to do with it. So um, with these, we explored trims, we exaggerated borders so that the garments look like they have layers, they are rich on stage, but at the same time create a silhouette for the cast. So what you're looking at is um, a costume for one of the characters, his name is Naosuke. In this whole ensemble, um, from afar, you, you, you may think that it's one, two, three, four and five layers. But in actual fact, it's only one layer of uh, um, garment. So how the actor will put this on is, is just by slotting through the elasticized waistband at the back. So essentially, it's just one whole garment through and he puts on and he ties the, the jackets around his waist. So um, that way it really helps him or her to change between the characters really fast and all the garments and all the designs have been planned in such a way that it's really quick for them to put on. So besides fabrics, we also considered how um, creating def defined shapes on stage will help aid the idea of stiffness of stru or structured um, silhouettes on stage. Um, so having watched phase one of rehearsals where cast members actually do like a half, they move in a horizontal half squat uh, manner. Um, we designed a lot of the bottoms and pants in such a way that when they are in a half squat position, you literally see a triangle and coupled with a very boxy top and together with how the actors are going to um, um, execute a half squat position, essentially you are looking at a rectangle on top and a triangle at the bottom. So these two contra contrasting elements really help to create a visual contrast rather than just one huge um, rectangular block on stage, which is quite, uh, I would say, familiar when you're talking about Japanese costumes, the kimono is cut on a rectangular and column-like um, bodice. Whereas for, for Oiwa, um, we have um, played and contrasted different shapes and, and make sure that they go well together. Uh, research is utmost important to us because we really do want to represent the Japanese costumes and cultures in a very respectful and dignified manner. So, we looked at a lot of historical visual references on how the Japanese costumes are constructed, the philosophies behind it. I'm a very graphic person, so I'll usually go into collaging things together. The inspiration informs the process rather than the inspiration informs the outcome because when you do that, it becomes a very literal translation and almost becoming souvenir-like garments. And I don't think that's very respectful of uh, uh, a culture or any cultures at all. So I work very closely with my assistant designer Waito on all my projects and even more so on Uiwa because um, the technical finishing and the assembly of the garments need to go hand in hand with the construction and the tailoring side of things. So I play the role of designing but at the same time, he comes in as a second eye to help me see whether things are visible when it comes to realizing them uh, realistically. So um, when I'm tailoring the garments, we usually do that together. That's where he will help me observe proportions and tell me how he's going to um, 
assemble this garment or finish this garment and, and those inputs are very important to me because as a creative I can be quite um, single vision at times and it really helps to have a second eye to, to bring in new ideas and to explore and expand the language instead of just relying on one source. This design process is such that I can really indulge in my fascination and interest for the horror genre. I looked into things that I'm familiar with. I went into research or into Hopa Villa, the different statues, the colours being used, what are the silhouettes, how do I create this ghastly effect using bright colours and that's that, that really fascinates me um, because usually colours and prints is celebratory, it's joyous when, when on the other hand, having gone through the process, it can also mean the complete opposite which is horrific, um, sad or destructive. Zhi Qin's brief to me was actually quite brief largely based on the trust and understanding we have developed over the years. Timeless, Ghost in the Shell meets Akira. So it was more impressionistic than concrete. But this also gives me a lot of room. I have always believed in sound being tactile. So my approach has always been to create sounds and music that not only can be sensed orally, affect emotionally and psychologically, but also be felt physically and physiologically. It has to be tangible. So for Oyua, I hope to create a world or mind space through my sounds, which the characters live in, where this narrative happens in time, when the audience bears witness to what unfolds. I hope to create a place where the hairs on their bodies can feel the dank air, the pores suffocate and the darkness touches. The sounds should make one feel uncomfortable either via the power of suggestion or simply psychoacoustically. Both of us agreed that we should not go for the obvious choice of cheap jump scares. So creating a haunting and unsettling environment through the use of tasteful and effective sounds is important. Thus, eliciting distress restlessness and uncertainty from the audience is more crucial than just evoking fear. This leaves room for their own minds to make a heightened sense of the situation and their own adrenaline to speak, as the both of us believe that chanced fear within themselves is more frightening when unsold. One of the immediate challenges I faced was finding and creating the right contemporary sounds that juxtaposes, but at the same time, fits within the period and the cultural context of the play, without being overly intentional and alienating. This instrument was one of the few instruments I had constructed over the past four years as part of my tactile sound explorations, that is, creating sounds through touch. It is a handmade electroacoustic instrument that can create unsettling sounds and noises through the vibration of metal and the resonance of it within a wooden chamber. This particular one I'm employing for the show was actually inspired by Tony Dugan Smith's apprehension engine. I was intrigued by it, but since I couldn't afford to buy one, I thought I would just make one. I have since made other renditions of it based on similar concepts. My job is to design a sound system. And when I say sound system, means the whole chain of equipment and technique ranging from microphones, whether you mic the cast, the band members, the instrument, the musician, and then playback of sound effects, design of that particular sound effect as well sometimes. And then all kind of mixed it up together, trigger at the right place, mix at the right level, coming out from of speakers that we design in terms of placement, quantity, and stuff like that. 
the work that I do involves a lot of kind of customization and also about understanding what the creative team, creative director, you know, company, why they employ me in the first place. So one, one misconception that I, I'm very vocal about this is the whole notion about time for audio, time on stage for audio, because theatre at the end of the day is a visual art form. So visual will always trump everything. So uh, I guess I, I've accepted this and for the past 25 years learned to live like a second class citizen. So which I don't really blame you know, there's no, it's no, there's no animosity towards that because it is a visual form. That's why what you can see takes precedent over what you can hear. So then, which means that lots of people will feel that whatever music, sound element should be prepared to the point whereby, you know, it's a finished product. Then when we go to the theatre, all we need to do is set level and then Bob's, is, Bob's your uncle. Congratulations, opening night. Which is a completely... I would even use word like a wrong approach to that. Costume, lighting, set, props, they need the cast to interact with it in the venue during the entire rehearsal period to finesse the show, same as us. We need the same stage time as well. So it's not about you record your flute, you mix your flute, you do your best you can and make it sound fantastic and then we just chuck it in the theatre at the right time, at the right level, thank you very much. So, so nowadays you have heard, heard about in, uh, immersive sound, you know, we don't use two left and right and now it's like five speaker across, surround sound, so worse. Even more consideration, even more things that, you know, so because I have I, I have ever encountered directors and people telling me, like, why is this not done in rehearsal? You know, it cannot be done in rehearsal. That's what I'm saying. You know, yeah, you can produce working draft, you can produce correct timing and so but eventually whatever the audience here in the venue needs to be mixed and needs to be produced in the venue. That's one of the reasons why I love doing theatre so much. It's because it's counterintuitive. It's you need to shine but not steal any thunder. You need to be noticed but in an unnoticeable way. <laughs> so all this is like very, you know, a musician can grab his guitar, can grab his drum set, play as well and as long as he wants to and present his craft as is. Uh, I cannot do that. You know, old people, no, nobody notice good sound. So if nobody say anything, usually you are doing a good job. Everybody will notice bad sound. You know, so instead of a phone ring, it's like, you know, fried eggs. Uh. Everybody's like, uh, what's going on? You know? Which is fine too, it's not, not, there's no right or wrong, but there is appropriate and not appropriate. Uh. The three of us, we actually came up with a few points that, that will always guide us um, in our design or when we make. Um, I mean, one of it is really uh, being inspired by the Japanese aesthetics and the culture. So we went to study kabuki, no, and we also had um, a traditional Japanese uh, marionette master to come over to Singapore to train us. Um, so, and then the next direction is um, the blend between beauty and horror. Um, horror is a very tricky genre for us. Uh, we also had this discussion about colours, whereby we use colours to differentiate the status of the characters. And also the idea of exploring, um, blending in the colours of the mask with the skin colour of the wearer. So then we blur the line between the mask and the wearer, the puppet and the human. For the puppets, uh, we began with the Japanese marionette. So aesthetics-wise, the base was already there and then we developed from there. And then TC was quite specific with his vision. He wanted to see many marionettes emerging from the stage. Uh, so then in terms of movement, he had suggestions of running, jumping, crawling. 
There were two immediate challenges that emerged. Uh, the first was the sheer numbers of puppets. Um, we initially experimented with only two puppets and getting those two to synchronize uh, was already quite difficult. And then to increase that to four, uh, it, it became increasingly technically challenging. And also because of the weight of four puppets moving together, that was one challenge that we had to overcome. Um, the second was also uh, about having to convert the downward movement of a marionette puppet into uh, kind of a horizontal movement. So one of the actions that Zizian wanted us to uh, use was uh, the crawling puppet. And for crawling, the movement is back and forth, but then the operation of a marionette is up and down. So we had to overcome and translate that. But by doing so, uh, it meant that we needed to turn the puppet into a pivot point and that also started to make things quite challenging. Mm. So also for, for us, when in our different phases of uh, experimentation and discussion with uh, Zichen, um, the, the marionette puppet design also starts to evolve. Um, partly also really considering um, the venue at Victoria Theatre, really a big theatre. Um, how do we kind of achieve that kind of aesthetics of having a lot of um, puppets crawling um, walking, running, um, and because the traditional marionette size is really quite small, we also had to work with um, the height of the puppeteer. And um, so if you are slightly shorter, then the, <laughs> the string cannot be too long, um, which means then the puppet will have to be smaller. Eventually, we decided that, okay, maybe marionette um, is not the puppet form that we can use for this big stage. Um, but what we will do is to really take the marionette um, discipline, the principles, what we got through the two phases of experimentation to evolve to um, the OIWA puppets that we you would see in future. So other than having very limited time with the master to learn how to manipulate the Japanese marionette uh, within a very, very short time, in general, marionettes are the hardest to master because everything is controlled and balanced by strings. And the build and manipulation needs to be actually very precise. And this precision can actually be achieved only with years of practice and experience. The next challenge we have is actually in the realm of the mask. We had to create a mask that is um, very close to really human-like, but at the same time having very strong expressions um, for the big theatre space. So that is really a challenge for, for all of us. Um, also because we wanted to base the mask design on the no, Japanese no mask, um, and usually um, they are, their expressions are slightly more um, subtle, very, um, very gentle, um, only for the otherworldly characters that then they will have very, very strong expressions. Um, so in phase one and phase two, we did experiment with the different expressions. And so now we are at this point where we kind of have to um, negotiate between these two, um, really having um, expression that the audience can see from far, but at the same time still keeping very, um, hopefully close to the Japanese uh, no mass aesthetics. Yeah, then also, of course, we have to consider things like durability and hygiene because it's very hot uh, to be wearing a mask for a long period of time. And as performers, we generally sweat a lot also. So if the water gets into gets trapped into the mask or gets retained, it will weaken the structure and then over time, the mask will actually disintegrate. And we wanted it to be waterproof so that we could also clean it after use uh, for hygiene purposes. My approach to design is quite um, performer-centric. Um, maybe also because partly um, I also perform. So in some ways, when um, come when I designed, um, say for example, the mask of the character, um, I would also want to look at the personality of the performer. Um, how does he or she um, present or perform that character, and um, using that as a um, inspiration to to tweak the design. And so for, for OIWA, because we have uh, the luxury of time, we had multiple phases. So I get the, I have the opportunity to meet the Japanese actors and also our Singaporean actors and to see them on stage performing and interpret the character. Um, so after watching them in phase one and two, then I went back to the characteristics of the characters in the script as well as to match the performer's personality. So that's how I came up with the design of the mask. 
to add on, we are also looking at the items as an individual and as a collective. So each individual item, mask, puppet that we create needs to stand out on its own. But at the same time, if you put everything together, they belong to the same production. And then of course, uh, we are puppeteers and performers. So we also have to consider in terms of say functionality, how easy is it for uh, puppeteers to manipulate the things that we create. Uh, for myself, I, I usually begin from inside out. So I need to figure out the mechanism and how the, the puppets or the objects move. Uh, because I feel like movement defines the design of your puppet. Uh, and then only after figuring out the mechanism, then I, I look at the overall and the aesthetics of that object and that puppet. And then, uh, yeah, and then put everything together. Um, one of the most time-consuming thing I had to make is the Oiwa mask. Um, it's really a, a struggle. <laughs> um, also because uh, we had to create um, close to about like 20, 20 pieces of Oiwa mask. Um, and I'm a human. <laughs> so, and we really mold it from scratch. So how to actually ensure that the Oiwa mask, all 20 pieces of them look, look the same. Um, that is already something that, um, that keeps me up at night. <laughs> And also, um, Oiwa is a very complex character. Um, she, she's very kind, she's gentle, um, but at the same time, in the story itself, you also see her strength, um, her aggressiveness, the brutality, um, and, how, and how do we merge this two uh, spectrum of personalities into one look? Um, that is really something that um, I'm still struggling with and um, to be honest, we are still in the midst of um, um, finding the right look for, for Oiwa. I think the decision to move on from uh, using the Japanese marionettes uh, and to develop the design uh, was a bit bittersweet for me because I can imagine that that visual spectacle of having many marionettes appearing uh, to become very, very powerful. Uh, but also at the same time, we have to acknowledge that the process was too time consuming, too, too much precision and uh, practice and, and experimentation was required that then we also had to make the call to kind of move on from that particular design. So other than what Daniel mentioned, the research and development phase is actually very time consuming. Uh, also because of resources uh, limitations, we actually use a lot of paper mache technique to actually strengthen the mask to increase uh, the durability. And uh, for those of you who have done paper mache, you know it's a, it's a long and tedious process and you have to wait for every single layer to dry and the whole process just keeps repeating. Yeah. So with regards to working during the COVID period, it's a very, very helpless sense that we are feeling because there's only so much that we can do and design on paper. And um, actually, when it comes to building uh, and designing puppets, especially prototypes is actually an essential part of the process. Yeah. And we need space, which we don't have at home. Uh, space to build large structures, space that you can get dirty when you cut wood. And if you build from home, you have to clean up every time. So that just makes it tedious and very tiring. I think another point is also, um, especially when it comes to like the colour of um, what we want to choose on our materials. Um, we need to come together to feel the material, to look at the colour and say, yeah, this is what we want. And that is something that we cannot do via an online, Zoom. <laughs> via Zoom, yes. Um, so we, we can, we, in, in some ways, we, it's nice that now we can sit down together here to make this video um, and, this is, and, and we have to treasure this time la, that where we can come together to really sit down and discuss things um, and to work in the workshop. Um, we understand that because of this time that the experimentation process has cut short. Um, that is just something that we have to um, negotiate with the rest of the world. The three of us have worked together um, <laughs> on several projects. <laughs> yeah, on several projects. And um, we, we have um, argued a lot with each other, uh, with one another. Um, we sat down together and cried over like, this is what you said and that was blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so we, we kind of have a sense already of um, how our what uh, how we approach design, how we approach making um, our personalities, um, and and so in some ways it's kind of like how we work together is we we come together to discuss like okay this is the direction that we want to go. This is we present our research. We discuss about the general direction. Um, and then we kind of split our the work between the three of us lah, and we all have our own um, strengths and weaknesses, and we split the job according to that. Um, and then whenever whenever we have some problems or we want to check in with each other, then we will call for a meeting again to sit down. Um, in terms of schedule, because we are all freelancers and we have different projects along the way, so. Uh, over the long period of time, we, we do have scheduled meetings once a month or twice a month and then uh, we would then take our own timeline to build our, our different projects or, or different parts of the design. Yeah, and then after that, we'll gather again and then discuss and then decide which new direction do we want to explore in. Yeah, so in general, working together as a team is very different from if you were to design as an individual. So there's a lot of give and take in the process and a lot more communication. So this communication is not just going on in your head, but also how do we learn to communicate what we are thinking to make sure that the rest of the team understands also. Yeah, and I guess time helps lah for, to, to find that uh, common understanding and that general common sense of aesthetics. Thank you for watching. Do look out for part 3 coming to you in December.